When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick. Join me and this guy, for we are off to see the lizard. Here is the captain. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today, we are still sipping on this great beer from Saucony Creek Brewing called Honest Trav's Dive Bar Ale. This is a very drinkable, heck, it's delicious. Wheat beer brewed with coriander and orange peel, ABV 4.6%, 4.62% if you want to be exactly right. Garage grade four out of five bottle caps. And this week's beer was brought to us by you good folks out there listening at work in your cars, in your garage. But let's give some thanks and praise to some folks who helped us out this week. First up, a shout out to Tobin, the bass player from Papa Roach and his true crime garage listening girlfriend, Amber. Yeah, Papa Roach has been the house band and parts unknown for quite a while now. And a big shout out to Jesse in Aurora, Colorado. Next up, we have M from the Twin Cities in Minnesota. And a big shout out to Michaela and Kayla and parts unknown. Make sure you turn in your bonfire fees. Next, we have Charlie Barnaby in Newburyport, Maine. We also have Jaina, who says she loves the captain's music, not just the music he makes for our little garage show here. She says she loves his other stuff. That's the Captain Fat Hands and St. Patrick Projects. For those of you that would like to check that out, it's crap. there is a link to the captain's music and website on truecrimegarage.com. And that is, as they say, enough of the business. Everyone gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Where we left off yesterday, we have a man named Leopold Dion who was arrested on May 27th. And despite having any real evidence against this guy in the case of the four missing youths, we are going to hold this man because he is picked up on a parole violation, which means he's going to sit there and he's going to wait until he either talks or we can build a case against this guy. He very quickly becomes prime suspect number one in this case. Like we're saying, this is a really good strategy because we have four children that have gone missing, but we have no crime scene. We have no eyewitnesses of seeing these uh, individuals get into a car with anybody. We have no sign of a struggle. We don't have items of these four individuals that were left behind somewhere. 
So there's no crime scene, really. So he's arrested and sitting in a jail cell for about two weeks. When on June 12th, the body of Guy Luckenwick was found by accident by a hunter. The boy was buried in a shallow grave. The cause of death, homicide. Manner of death, homicide by strangulation. So Leopold Dion was starting to crack as the pressure just kept growing and growing. To the point that eventually he breaks and he tells the investigators that he was in fact responsible for the boys having gone missing. And he led the police to the three remaining bodies on July 5th. Two of the victims were buried together. This is the two that went missing together, Alan and Michael. They were buried in the same grave. And this was basically right next to the grave of the last to go missing, Perry Marquis. This earned Leopold Dion the moniker of the Monster of Pont Rouge. This whole thing moves along rather quickly, doesn't it, Captain? Mm -hmm. Here, like we've already seen in other cases, is a person that spends most of his adult life in prison because as soon as he gets out, he reoffends and then he goes back in so the cycle can start all over again. Then he is out, probably never should have been released to begin with. But he is, and then within a matter of months, not years, he is not even out for a single year, and he is on the prowl. And what did his long stint in prison teach him? Well, if I'm going to rape, I better kill, and I better make sure that they are dead, because what got me busted at least twice, if not more, mm -hmm. the person I attacked became the numero uno witness in the case, and the province built a case against me. So, the best witness is a dead witness, and the best victim is a dead victim. And also because of his health history as a, as a kid, being in isolation for what they said, 11 years or so, I mean, this guy has spent probably more time locked up or in isolation than he's spent in the free world. Now, once he has made up his mind what kind of victim he desires, what fantasies he wants to act out with his victim, and he has decided it is in his best interest to kill the victim after he is satisfied, he is out trolling. And once he offends again, he is doing so in rapid succession. He likely was out there every weekend during that 40-day period in which he procured four victims. He likely was even out there weekends before he was successful in his mission. Well, and we see multiple times in these cases where the addiction is stronger, grows stronger, and so there's less time in between victims. Yeah, he probably started with the very basics like we've seen in other cases. Where do I find the victim type that I'm looking for? And how do I abduct them without being noticed or drawing attention to myself? Yeah, what's my ruse? And how do I kill them? And then where do I put them? After figuring out most, if not all of this task, likely spending the most time on the where do I locate and go unnoticed portion, he worked on practicing his ruse. You can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. Oh, I will befriend them and offer them something. This is probably rehearsed time and time again. The first boy he approached likely did not go with him. So he tried and tried again. And once it worked, he did it again. And then he needed a victim more often. And then the next victim he needed sooner than the last. But I also wonder, since he wasn't out of prison for that long, maybe it was hard for him to get a, a weapon that he could use so he wouldn't have to be nice to capture these individuals. So there is little to report on regarding Leopold's adult life because most of that time was spent in prison and then he gets out and masters his craft. But thank God he has picked up before he reached Green River killer speed in numbers. Right. And after he leads the investigators to the three bodies, this guy is facing a jury by the end of the month. I love swift justice and an efficient system, and in this instance, boom, we have it. Later, in the month of July, this is 1963, the same year. Well, question for you, do you think that's because 
he is confessing. I mean, we saw, you know, pretty quick justice as far as, you know, the, the states are concerned with the Chris Watts case, but that's also because he was compliant with law enforcement and he was giving them information. So same thing here, obviously a different country. Correct. I think it's a multitude of reasons. I think you're, you've honed in on the number one reason that he has confessed in some roundabout way. Yeah. So you're not putting together, you're not forced as a prosecution to put together such an extensive case unless you're worried about a technicality or something shifting during the course of the trial. But I also think it has to do with the time period, because when we've reviewed cases from the 60s and even the 70s, mm-hmm. the wheels of justice seem to move a little faster back then. Right. Less bullshit. Yeah. There's a lot more to sift through these days, and that's that probably makes us a better society and possibly a better system overall in the, in the, at the end of the day. Well, also more scientific evidence. The other situation that we're dealing with here, I'm not going to pretend to understand current day Canadian law, let alone 1963 Canadian law. Well, good thing I'm an expert on it. Right. Mm. They did handle things obviously a little different than we do now. Later in the month of July 1963, several persons testified to the facts of the case. Of course, we have the parents and friends of the victims testify to help piece together a timeline of events Mm -hmm. for when each of our victims went missing for the jury. One person that testified was David Derome of Pont Rouge. He said that on May 5th, the day the last boy went missing, He was driving out on a country road. Now, this road ran alongside a bunch of his father's property. We're talking about a big piece of property here. While driving, he spotted a black vehicle parked at an old abandoned farmhouse on his dad's property. Mm -hmm. Knowing that no one was really to be there, he jotted down the license plate number on a pack of cigarettes. He meant to then later ask his father about the vehicle, but before he managed to do so, he started to see the news about the missing kids and then the arrest. So he gave this information to the police. This plate number came back to, of course, Leopold Dion. Police believed that this abandoned farmhouse was somehow connected to the killings. Maybe this is where he intended to take the boys or did in fact take them there and maybe... Maybe he even killed one or two of the boys at this location. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But by far, the most damning testimony at the hearing was that of the monster himself. Leopold Dion, at his murder trial, described in minute detail how he allowed each boy to say a prayer before he killed them. This was in an extraordinary two and a half hours of testimony when Dion described the crimes in horrific detail. What a horrible piece of shit. I mean, oh, by the way, you're going to die, so say a prayer. The basics, he said, he picked up the boys on three separate spring weekends posing as a magazine photographer. Then he killed them when they refused to submit to his demands. His only defense, of course, was insanity. Heck, he led the investigators to three of the missing kids' concealed buried bodies. If you are not the one who put them there then you better have a really good story and some strong evidence to back that shit up. Here are some of the more dramatic moments and statements of LD's testimony. He said, quote, I have always said to all who have questioned me that at the moment when I committed these crimes, at the time when I killed these little children, I was not aware of it in the depths of myself. Now, part of his confusion slash testimony was as follows quote these two damned hands of mine have killed four little saints what has happened to me today is not my fault i am 43 years of age and i haven't lived yet i killed them i do not know why i say it to the whole world society could perhaps think it is satisfied with what it has done and with what it is going to do to me Perhaps the fact that society will be satisfied will relieve many. They want to strangle me during my life. Let them strangle me. All right. Let's examine this testimony in greater detail now that we have 
all of those theatrics out of the way. Mm -hmm. Leopold Dion said he told all four boys that he was a photographer for an American magazine. He picked them up in his car and then drove them out into the country about 25 miles away. There were 60 police on hand at the trial. You heard me correctly. 60, six zero police officers spread inside the courtroom and barricading the outside as well. They kept LD handcuffed to two officers for most of the trial. So he's got one arm handcuffed to one police officer, one arm handcuffed to another police officer. They were taking no chances during this whole situation. It was said that these two officers were two of the largest men on the force at the time. See, that that'd be my problem. They would attach me to this <laughs> asshole. And then I look over and he'd probably have a boner and he's like probably rubbing he you know, he probably was rubbing their hands every now and then. Captain, we finally found a perfect job for you. Yeah, just it's called a paperweight, but you're going to act just like a paperweight, but for a prisoner. Now, LD's testimony numbed the courtroom and left the relatives of the victims crying out loud in the court. He described how he sexually attacked and strangled Guy Luckenwick. He said he did it because he didn't want the kid to tell anyone because then he would have to go back to the penitentiary. He said he told him to say his prayers because he said he didn't want to keep him from going to heaven. He said, I told the boy I had no choice in the matter. The boy said, if I let him go, that he promised he would not tell. But even if he meant it at the time, a little boy cannot be depended on. Dion said he gave the boy two minutes to pray. And afterward, he strangled the boy by squeezing as tight as he could as to not to drag it out any longer than necessary. Dion said he met the two boy victims. Alan and Michael and convinced them to go with him after showing them his camera. He had them pose for some pictures. Now, from my understanding here, captain, the camera that he used in his ruse, he never even had any film for this camera. Mm -hmm. So the entire time that he's doing all of this and manipulating people, he's, he's acting. He's just acting the entire time. Yeah. But don't you understand how that works? If you're a fake photographer, that you have to take fake pictures. That's the way it works. That's right. This is where that abandoned farmhouse comes into play. Mm -hmm. That is where he took these two kids. Dion said that he often slept there himself during this 40 days uh, of death and destruction. He took the two boys up to an attic room in the farmhouse. Now, at some point, while he's attempting to do whatever it is that he wants to do with the victims... He says that he heard a car outside. Mm -hmm. He said he looks out the window. He said that he saw a family. They appeared to him to be looking for a place to picnic. So they parked their car. And now this is where Dion almost gets caught, right? But he goes outside. He tells the people that, hey, this is private property and you got to leave. Right. And so not knowing any better, they do. He said that he went back into the farmhouse and had the boys again pretend to pose for the fake pictures. He decided he wanted to separate the boys, that it would be easy to manipulate them, control them, and ultimately kill them if they were separate. So he told one of them to go out to the car and listen to the radio. He then tied the other boy to the bed. During his testimony, Dion was asked if he knew what he was going to do to the boys to which Dion replied very well. So So it's all premeditated. Yeah. Yeah. So when the boy was told by Dion what he wanted to do with the boy, the boy refused. So he said, Michael was told he was going to be killed. So Michael began to pray out loud. He said a hail Mary and the act of contrition, both again out loud. And Dion said that, That is what made this whole thing so terrible. Dion said the boy never struggled and he died like a little angel. He then went to the other boy and then he told him, if you want to go to heaven, then you pray too. He then strangled him as well. He then said that he buried both bodies in the same grave in a clearing in the deep woods. 
So it seems like during this whole time period, like, do we have any idea where, like, Leopold was actually staying or was he just cruising around and living in his vehicle? I think he was staying, you know, where he could, and that might be involve the vehicle. But it sounds like most of the time, at least during this killing spree, he was sleeping in that abandoned farmhouse. This is kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Right. And he could, especially if he could conceal his vehicle, no one would even really know that he would be there. Later on, during that 40 days... This would be on May 26th. Dion said that he went to go swimming at Wolf's Cove. And that is how he first interacted with Perry, the fourth victim. He said he used the same MO as he used in the previous attacks. And he got the boy out into an isolated area. This again, probably that farmhouse. And he tried to force the boy to undress, and the boy resisted and fought him so hard that Dion said he had to pull a knife on the kid. But even after threatening him with the knife, Dion said there was just no way that he could stab the boy. So he, he's trying to get him to comply. The boy won't. He can't bring himself to physically stab the boy. So he then says that he bit the kid to force him to comply and then pray. And then Dion said he put a cord around the boy's neck and strangled him. Nah, he's a real piece of shit. He went on to testify to say that his fourth victim, he said he had the heart of a lion, the poor little one. He was then asked if he had any regrets, to which Dion replied, many. Then he went on to say maybe if the boys would have consented to the sexual acts, they would not have died, but I'm really not sure. They did show the jury a makeshift garrot that Leopold Dion fashioned from a piece of wire with a nail at each end to hold on to so he could tighten it. Mm -hmm. At the trial, one psychiatrist described Leopold Dion as a, quote, sexual monster with a human face. Max Haynes of Saskatchewan's newspaper, The Leader Post, called Leopold Dion a human time bomb. I mean, to be fair, I mean, he might have a human face, but it is an ugly human face. And it was the leader post that featured a fantastic article titled These Two Damned Hands, Leopold Dion Condemned Sex Slayer. The article reads, society has little reason to be satisfied with what it has done to Leopold in the past. Society put this man in prison for life in 1940 for rape. Society let him out 16 years later. Society put him back into prison for homosexual relations with a boy. Six years later, society let him out again. This time, Leopold Dion raped and strangled four boys. And this time, society is ending this charade. Society's self-destructive agent was the institution of parole. When it works, parole is progressive and desirable. When it bungles miserably, it is intolerable. A parole system which gives second and third chances to irredeemable criminal perverts such as Leopold Dion seems itself almost beyond redemption. Soft sentences, general prison instead of segregated institutions for sexual psychopaths, and careless parole. How careless society is with its own safety. How many other creatures are there free or jailed who may one day say as Leopold Dion said, These two damn hands of mine have killed four little saints. What has happened to me today is not my fault. Of course, it was not the fault of the lost and misbegotten maniac. It was ours. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded 
and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. You can live out your MasterChef dreams. When you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Inside to outside. Repairs to renovations. Get started on the Angie app or visit Angie.com today. You can do this when you Angie that. Cheers, mates. And if you need more True Crime Garage for your ear balls, you can find our old episodes. They're available everywhere. Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Sirius XM app. And every episode is also on Spotify, so check that out as well. Captain, it took the jury only two minutes to return the verdict after Leopold Dion testified for well over two hours. And you know somebody complained that they had... Well, why did we even come back here and sit down? Right. Why is this taking so long? Yeah. We could have just sat there. Yeah, I'm hungry. (laughs) It was announced that they would not be discussing why it was decided that Leopold Dion was granted parole in the first place during the trial and even after the trial. Basically, what was said is that the parole board has final say-so. They have exclusive jurisdiction in those matters. But this again, look, what what we could do is go, hey, do you want to let out of prison? Yes. Okay, well we're gonna we're gonna chop your dinghy off. We we ha- we're gonna guarantee no more rapes. Now the guy says, Well no, I now I wanna keep my dinghy. We go Okay, well we're gonna keep keep you in prison. That's what we're gonna do. In December of nineteen sixty three, he was convicted of one of the boys' murders. This was for thirteen year old Perry Marquis. Now criminal lawyer Guy Bertrand defended Dion at his trial, and to me it looks like Bertrand really did the best that he possibly could, given that his client confessed to the murders, led detectives to three of the four bodies, and had an extensive violent criminal past. We talked about this before. Leading the investigators to a body or bodies is always incredibly important to these cases and to the investigation and prosecution. Because what it says is we've seen time and time again where a killer or a suspected killer will confess to a murder, but then later recant that confession. Right. What you can't take back later is the fact that you actually led them to the deceased person's remains. Yeah, or your knowledge about the crime. Dion was, in the end, given a death sentence to be executed by way of hanging, the old drop-and-swing method. We So Leopold was sentenced to hang, but we are far from done, my friends, because while awaiting his date with the hangman, Dion requested an interview with Quebec prison governor Jean Latourin in the governor's office. This was on Wednesday, May 27th, 1964. During this interview, using what was described at the time as a crudely fashioned knife, Leopold attacked the governor, stabbing him several times 
and then using this man as a human shield as he made his way out of the prison. From the interview room, he managed to make it out of the prison, but not further than 200 feet from the prison walls, where two city policemen jumped him and clubbed him to the point of unconsciousness with the revolver butts. His pathway from the governor's office was marked with a trail of blood. It was later revealed that Dion concealed a letter opener under his clothing. Mm -hmm. It was an old-fashioned letter opener stabbing. Early reports said that the governor was in critical condition. The governor was stabbed a total of seven times by Dion, but later recovered from his wounds. Despite all of this, his death sentence was then later commuted to a life sentence in prison. This, of course, was met with a storm of protest. In 1972, at the age of 52. That's because they wanted to see the son of a bitch hang. They wanted to put him in the middle of the town and watch his legs dingle dangle. You know, that that would have been justice for the town. I mean, not only is he a monster that killed these four boys, then he goes and attacks the governor. I mean, this, this guy is an animal. In 1972, at the age of 52, Leopold Dion was attacked by deranged prisoner and convicted killer Norman Champagne and beat to death. Champagne was 29 at the time. Mm-hmm. Prison officials said Dion was attacked as he entered his cell after attending a therapy session in another part of the prison. An autopsy revealed that Dion died instantly from several blows to the skull from a metal bar. There are some more detailed information that came out well, years later. In yeah, you attack. wonder if uh, Leopold was threatening him in any way. Well, this guy has an interesting story. And I think we're going to go down this interesting road here. So it said that on the night that of Dion's death, Champagne went into the prison yard for exercises and managed to smuggle in a 14-inch metal bar that weighed about three pounds or more. Yeah, Pilates. Yeah, this was used for weightlifting. And Norman Champagne later told the investigating agency that he himself was actually Lawrence of Arabia and that he killed Dion on orders he received in his dreams. Mm. He said, quote, I was, I was scared of Dion. In one of my dreams, Lawrence told me I had to kill the desert monster before he killed me. I did it and I don't regret it. I'm liberated now from the desert monster. Champagne said in his dreams, Lawrence of Arabia told him You are me living in the 20th century. Mm. Champagne was in prison serving a life sentence himself for the rape and murder of a Quebec woman from uh, 1969. Well, yeah, that SOB is nuts. But good thing that he killed the monster of the desert. Well, Max Haynes, who we referenced earlier, writer Max Haynes, In a March 6th, 1982 article titled Justice Was Dealt in a Deadly Way, in which he cites, according to officials, Leopold Dion was hated by his fellow prisoners until the end. One guard at the maximum security prison said that in prisons, inmates hate rapists and child molesters as well as stool pigeons with the passion. Oddly enough, when Leopold was... At his murder trial years before, his attorney claimed that Leopold was insane. So basically it was an insanity defense. Yeah. The man that killed Leopold Dion, Norman Champagne, was later found to be criminally responsible, but then was later ruled to not be guilty by way of insanity. Well, it's weird with with Leopold as well because... On Off the Record this week, we did a two-parts update on the fifth nail. And and in that case, you have this horrific murderer that victim blames left and right. And here, you know, he's at least not victim blaming. He's not saying, you know, he, 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 he tells you these damn hands killed these angels and, and the, there was nothing that these kids did wrong. So it's, it's a whole different psychology of killer almost. Yeah. And he's 
on the stand, at least, he's trying to paint a picture of he couldn't control himself. I killed these kids, and I don't know why. Right. These damned hands, almost, that they're, his hands are cursed and have a mind of his own, and he has no control over them. Right, which is bullshit, but it's a lot better for the victims' families to hear stuff like that other than you know some of these other killers that go, well, you know, that they, they were asking for it, or they did A, B, C, and D, and that's what led me to want to kill them. It's their fault. Well, and what's weird in this case, too, I mean, there's always these these unique, intricate pieces inside of these larger stories that I find absolutely fascinating. And one, Leopold Dion probably should have never been left let out to begin with. Yeah, I agree. And then we have all of this tragedy that is brought about by him being paroled. He's sent to prison again, and there's never, it's really difficult, right? These are hard, hard lessons to learn. It's like we were learning it the hard way, they would say, because we let him out and we sentence him to death and later commute that back to a life sentence. Then we have a convicted killer. A piece of shit. Who is already in prison. He conv- he kills Leopold. And they have the same defense for why they killed. It works out in Norman Champagne's favor. But Norman Champagne is another hard lesson learned. Because he's a guy, too, that they continue to want to reform. And let him out. And he is every bit as violent as Leopold Dion. Well, the insanity of these individuals, the maliciousness, the violence, the they're you know, they're almost demonic. They're inhumane, right? They're all these things. But we keep trying to have this system that is humane. You know, oh well, we we have the death penalty, but when we when we do it, we don't. We now we just inject you. You know, we don't want to make it too violent. And and I just wonder if I'm going to say something, and maybe you'll get it, and maybe people out there will get it. But it's it's kind of like the Joker and Batman, right? The Joker is playing by a different set of rules than Batman is. And that's almost the way I feel about our justice system is the killers, they're playing by a whole different set of rules and we're still trying to, we're trying to hold up some kind of rule set, if that makes any sense. And so it's like, okay, yeah, we'll put you in jail, but now now we're going to let you out because our, our system's too lax. And then we see what happens time and time again. Well, this is something we've been preaching here in the garage since we started, was that there there needs to be a distinct difference, an understood difference between violent offenders and nonviolent offenders. Because in a lot of cases, you have people being pushed out of prisons because of they're overpopulated. There's not enough room for all of these people. Yeah, there's too much shit. And I'm not afraid of a nonviolent offender. That's... That's not who I'm afraid of. That's not who society is afraid of. Right. The person that rips families apart and rips communities apart is the violent offender. Now, this Norman Champagne, I said he's a rather fascinating story. He has a rather fascinating history. But this is to go along to show that it was it was the same mistake repeated with the guy that killed the guy that you made the mistakes with to begin with. Right. So Norman Champagne, he ends up creating some kind of working relationship, if you will, with the famous newsman. He's now famous newsman, but at the time was not. His name is Claude Poyer. The legend began to take shape on June 11, 1973, during a 10-hour hostage crisis at Montreal's Maximum Security Psychiatric Hospital. Okay, so he's in prison already for killing a woman in 1969. Then he kills Leopold Dion inside the prison. Now this man is involved in a 10-hour hostage crisis. Inside, Norman Champagne was armed with scissors and holding three, three employees against their will. He wanted his freedom, 
And he wanted to see if Claude Poyer, the newsman, he was a radio reporter at the time, then only 34 years old. He wanted to see this man and speak with him and have him aid him in his freedom that he was seeking. The radio reporter, Claude, he exchanged himself for the three hostages. And then he drives this madman away in a highly visible radio car. You know, so that at some point, police can stop this madness from going on. Right. Poyer later reported that Champagne wanted him to drive him back to the desert. Oh, yeah, because he has to kill. Well, he's Lawrence of Arabia. Right. In his mind. And in fact, he ended up going to see his mother and then his sister, and that's where police were able to recapture this psychopathic murderer Mm -hmm. before he could make it to his next plan stop, which was he was asking the reporter to take him to the uh, Montreal bus station. So he's locked up once again. And (laughs) this is what is completely bizarre, Captain. An escape attempt, a hostage crisis, two murders under this guy's belt. And what do they do? They parole Norman Champagne. Oh my God. They release him from the psychiatric Institute where they are housing him uh, because he's, he's cured. You gotta be stupid. Then you have this news article, Norman champagne at this point in our timeline, captain, he is 44 years of age. They're calling him a convicted murderer. And I couldn't figure out where this came from prize winning artist. So apparently he's quite, the artist, but he and two other people were arrested on November 19th. And this would have been in the early eighties. I think it was 1982 after police foiled a plot to kidnap two female employees from a McDonald's restaurant and hold them for ransom and possibly kill one of them. If the money wasn't paid, the police found out about this plot through a man named Jean Jacques Rochon. Originally, he was supposed to be one of the people involved in this whole hostage situation. He was going to be an accomplice. Hmm. He ended up contacting the authorities when he discovered that the mastermind, this Norman Champagne, was planning on probably killing one of the hostages anyway. Right. He's like, wait a second. I was just in this for some money. Now, now there's going to be an actual murder involved. No, I'm, I'm not only, only am I out. But I am outing you and the others as well. Yeah, because he's insane. What ended up happening was this Roshan was so messed up with the whole situation that he ended up committing suicide not long before the police were able to track down this group and arrest them. Now, police said that the crime champagne planned to commit, they called it one of the most serious in the criminal code. And they described the evidence against Champagne in this case as, quote, revolting and repugnant. Along with passports, the three criminals were going to use to escape to Brazil after the kidnapping, police seized weapons and a video cassette that was to be used to make the ransom demands to the McDonald's chief executives. The video shows Norman Champagne in a in flowing robes and a turban, his eyes shielded by amber tinted glasses, styling and profile. While Johann Strauss's Blue Danube plays in the background, and you can see shots of a McDonald's restaurant, Golden Arches. Champagne is heard talking about the profits of the McDonald's chain and saying, "Quote: McDonald's exploits its employees. McDonald's is an in- exploiter that we can use to get rich." Mm. The scene on the video then changes to and, show and you're sure it's a McDonald's and not a McDowell's. <laughs> the scene then changes to show champagne holding an ax. And now he's saying, I am Lawrence of Arabia. I'd like you to meet my partner, the mm. ax. I am declaring war on McDonald's. Champagne goes on to say that he will decapitate one of the hostages. He says, quote, I'm going to take out her heart, put it on a skewer, roast it, and then put it between two small buns. Champagne then says, and I can do worse today. I can't go back into society. I've tried. 
I have tried counseling, but there is nothing to be done. I've been inside too long. The only thing that's left is the ax. Well, and, and by him having those two buns, we're, so we're, we're stating that he's not on a keto diet. So oddly enough, just like Leopold Dion, this maniac was somehow released back into society. I want to thank everybody so much for joining us here in the garage, joining us every week to dive into these cases, deep dives, none of that Wikipedia episode stuff. And if you want more true crime, go to truecrimegarage.com. Check out our store page. We got new shirts, new merchandise, and also sign up on that mailing list because we send out probably once a month, every other month, we send out a promo code so you get a great discount. You get to support the show. You get to support the garage, but get something in return by simply signing up for the mailing list. So check that out at truecrimegarage.com. Colonel, do you have any recommended reading? This week, we are going to double down on the recommendations. That's right. We got two for you this week. The first recommendation is go and listen to our other show. It's called Off the Record. It's available on Stitcher Premium. And if you use the link on our website, you get a free month of listening. We put out a new episode every two weeks with case updates, listener questions, guest interviews, and of course some shenanigans. But once in a while, we put out an extra episode like we did this week. So go check out this week's two episodes and we'll be back on Off the Record again next week with a conversation with true crime author and historian Harold Schechter. Harold is the author of this week's recommended reading, his new book, Maniac, The Bath School Disaster and the Birth of the Modern Mass Killer, is available in all forms everywhere. Thanks to everyone out there in listener land for lending us your earballs for this week. If you are at work and you're bored, please go and leave us a five-star review with a nice write-up. And until next time, be good, be kind, and don't live. You can live out your master chef dream. When you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Inside to outside, repairs to renovations. Get started on the Angie app or visit Angie.com today. You can do this when you Angie that.